can see the lymph nodes um, very easily. Um, and these pictures really can't be beat in terms of looking at um, this disease process um, with um, the multiplanar, multi-dimensional uh, views. So let's see, China, next slide. So this right here, this is an MRI of a patient that I recently saw. So this is a patient that underwent uh, first colonoscopy and um, was found to have a malignant polyp, multiple clips were placed. And basically all they could tell me on the MRI was the distance that of where the clips were because the clips performed all this artifact. So this is a patient that MRI staging wasn't applicable to. I suppose we could have waited longer for the clips to um, come off, but the clips can last for quite a long time. So when is endorectal ultrasound good for rectal cancer staging? It's most useful uh, for very early stage disease, uh, delineating between the difference between T0, T1, T2. Um, if there are metallic implants and clips, you can still get adequate um, staging. The ultrasound is, isn't affected by that. Uh, if the patient has an MRI incompatible device, those are patients that need to be staged by endorectal ultrasound. And then the sensitivity and specificity in lymph node staging is actually fairly similar to MRI. The disadvantages are it's really dependent on the operator and the person performing the examination. Um, there's questions about whether you can see the circumferential resection margin on um, ultrasound, although some experienced ultrasonographers can see it. Um, there's a lot of patient discomfort. Most of these tests are staged without um, sedation. Um, and then obviously if like you have a stenotic lesion, it's very, very difficult to get the probes um, by those um, areas and, and to get a good staging. So I wanted to show you guys what the probe looks like. So this is uh, the probe that we use. This is a 3D ultrasound probe. This piece right here is um, a cap that you can uh, attach the condom and instill uh, water in it. Because what you need to do is you need to have a balloon interface with the rectum. Uh, you don't want air because the air interferes with uh, transmitting the ultrasound waves. Um, we use a special practice scope that we uh, do the proctoscopy through, and then the probe goes through that. And the probe, the practice scope creates like a cuff. So then when you inflate the balloon, only the last six centimeters here um, will insufflate in the patient. And the present probe um, has, what it does is it, it, the probe will travel from the end to the um, to six centimeters uh, distal to the uh, tip. And that creates these six centimeter boxes of data uh, that we can get in terms of staging. So um, typically patients are prepped with two fleet enemas. Uh, you suction out any residue because that's going to interfere with your images. You use the large bore proctoscope first. Uh, in the very distant past, there were radiologists doing this without taking a look. And you really can't get good images if you don't look at what you're trying to image. So when you do the proctoscopy, you're looking at where the, um, the lesion is, you wanna assess uh, and measure where it is and sort of note the morphology of the lesion. It's really important that you have to get above the lesion to adequately stage it. And typically we just try to get as high as we can. Um, uh, and we wanna get into um, the, um, uh, above the extraperitoneal rectum. You suction out any debris, and then it's really important to sort of correlate what you're seeing on proctoscopy with what you will see when you get your ultrasound images. So in terms of reading ultrasounds, uh, the main principles are that tissues are, that are hyperechoic are tissues that have a lot of collagen, uh, like the submucosa or the fat, and these will appear white on ultrasound. Uh, tissues that have a high level of water will appear hypochoic, so that's muscle, and those will appear black. So basically you're looking at shades of black and white on the ultrasound. So this is our model um, where the water in the balloon that you insufflate uh, will be black. The first white inner line is the interface between uh, the balloon and the rectal wall. The uh, second um, uh, line, which is the first black inner line, that's the muscularis mucosa. So that's where the lesions will originate. The most important line to remember is the middle white line. That's the submucosa. That's what's gonna differentiate between an invasive lesion and a non-invasive lesion. This black outer line, that is the muscularis propria. 
And then the outer white line is the interface between the muscularis propria and the, and the fat. It's really the line of the periorectal fat. So one easy way to remember this is, this is what Doug Wong used to teach us. This is the Big Mac model. So this middle white bread, that's the submucosa. And then you got your muscularis mucosa here, you got your muscularis propria here, you have uh, your interface of the balloon here, you have your um, periorectal fat here. And then that's what uh, you see these alternating five layers in the rectal wall. So again, you wanna make sure the patient's prepped, you wanna insert the proctoscope, see a lesion. And then when you're getting your images, you might need to vary the balloon volume because you need to have that apposition and you don't want air between your balloon and your rectal wall. You wanna make sure your, your transducer is centered in the rectum, and then you're gonna optimize your gray contrast. Um, it's important that you're above the tumor uh, when you're imaging, so you wanna get the whole lesion. You wanna pick up the corners um, of the lesion and you'll see what I'm talking about with that. And then you want to make sure you look for uh, lymph nodes and you in and image the entire tumor. So when you inflate that balloon, it's typically going to be somewhere between 90 to 150 cc's of water. It really depends on the size of the patient, the size of the rectum that you're imaging, and even the size of the lesion. And then when you hit the button that's looking at uh, creating it, you're actually going to just leave your ultrasound probe stable and pushing a button to scan the rectum is going to give you a six centimeter box of data. And then if you need to look at more, which most of us will, would have to, you then move and you get another six centimeter of, of uh, data. So this is an uh, image of, a, of where you would have to put more water in the balloon because there's a lack of apposition here. This is not a lesion. This is just a lack of contact between the two images. Uh, you can tell that the images are much clearer when the probe is centered versus uh, the, the lack of clarity with a non-centered uh, probe. And then obviously you can get more definition if you're using all your shades of gray as opposed to lacking the contrast. And this is just one of the fine nodule, two nodules you can use on the machine. And then really what you're looking for are these nice clear five layers of alternating white and black. And then you can actually see that on this three-dimensional cut view as well. So looking at some normal anatomy, if you were sitting in the rectum looking forward on a male patient, you can see the bladder, the seminal vesicles, and the prostate. And here what you see is this is what the bladder looks like, anterior to the rectum. This is what the seminal vesicles. When you start moving and looking at things, you can start getting cuts of the seminal vesicles that'll actually look like lymph nodes, but it's really important to realize um, uh, that you're just seeing a part of the seminal vesicle before you get the whole view of it. And then down here, you see the level of the prostate. And sometimes the rectum can actually look a little bit triangular right behind the prostate because it's flattened out in the anterior part portion. On a female view, if you're looking at this level right here, rectum, vagina, bladder, you can see rectum here, vagina, you can see the white of the air and the vaginal lumen. And then you can see the hypoechoic uh, fluid of the bladder right there. What you can look for is branching vessels. This looks different than a lymph node because it's a very same echogenicity compared to the water in the balloon. These are loops of valves. So you can see in the intraperitoneal um, uh, rectum, you can uh, really tell whether your lesion is intraperitoneal or extraperitoneal, if that makes a difference for you when you do your TEM or TAMIS. So um, it's important to look at all levels of the tumor. So this tumor right here looks like it's a T1 lesion. You see this nice intact muscularis propria here. But then if you go down a little bit inferior, you see this change where there's expansion of that uh, muscularis propria indicating a T2 lesion. And then you really wanna look for lymph nodes. They typically have the same echogenicity as the tumor. So here's tumor right here, lymph node here, lymph node here. So just to remind you about uh, rectal cancer staging, T0 is non-invasive combined to the uh, mucosa. T1 uh, is where um, the tumor will ex extend into the submucosa. So you're gonna see a break of some sort in that white line. The T2 usually looks where it, it goes into the muscular propria. So what that looks like is an expansion of that layer. T3 is when it extends into the periorectal fat. T4 is invading another uh, adjacent organ. And then we really just look for no positive disease um, uh, as opposed to uh, looking, and we, what we can't see obviously are those lateral lymph nodes. 
So here's an example of a T0. You're going to see that intact white line all the way around, intact white line right here that you can see. T1, you're going to lose that white. And often what you'll see is some, almost like a dotted line that looks like stippled. Here you can see coming in from the corners, loss of the white line, loss of the white line. But you can still see a very nice intact black line of the muscularis propria there. These are other examples of T1. You see some stippling and loss of that white line right here. This is a lateral view or sagittal view where you're looking and seeing uh, little losses of that white line, but nice intact muscularis propria above it. T2 lesion, really I think of it as an expansion of the muscularis propria. It tends to look pretty smooth right here. Here's expansion here. More examples of T2, nice and smooth. You can see uh, no stippling here. Here you see a very clear break in that um, submucosa and expansion of that muscularis propria. T3, usually you see the scalloping of the perirectal fat. And then, um, uh, so it's not an easy, it's not an easy smooth border that you'll see. Here are more examples, T3 scalloping right here lateral view of scalloping um, of the lesion, very irregular. And then a T4 is obviously invasion of another organ. This one might be a little bit difficult to see, but right here, the vagina's anteriorly, you can see that there's some invasion of the vaginal wall. This one's a bit easier to see. This is a um, prostate invasion. This is the prostate right here. You can, there's no line right here between the tumor and the prostate. Here's the same patient with a sagittal view and you lack, here's prostate right here, you can't see that clear border right there. And then here are some more examples of lymph node disease. Again, the lymph nodes have similar echogenicity as the tumor. So the 3D uh, does give us some um, uh, benefit um, where you can come in on the side and make sure that this is not a branching vessel as you can see on this image over here. So it does make our lymph node staging a bit more accurate. So accuracy, as we said before, is somewhere between 74 to 90%. Typically, if anything, we overstage compared to understage. Uh, lymph node metastasis staging is fairly uh, similar to MRI, um, except for those lateral lymph nodes, which are becoming more important. And the distance to the mesorectal fascia can be difficult to see. So uh, this is Julio Santoro's data of using 3D ultrasound, uh, which is what most of us who still do this are using right now. It does help both of our RT staging and mostly most of the failures of staging is overstaging T2 disease. So again, the limitations. The biggest thing nowadays is that it's hard to teach people how to do this because it's a steep learning curve. It's over 40 patients and we aren't really staging as many people by ultrasound anymore. And then, you know, what people can look at the same um, ultrasound and there can be different levels and differences in interpretation. So inter observer um, uh, uh, differences. And usually the person who does the exam actually has the highest accuracy. Uh, the ultrasound equipment is really, um, it's limited based on its transducer focal length, so you can't see as far away from the probe uh, as well. Uh, and again, it's difficult to see the mesorectal fascia uh, being with the distance it can have. And then the, the things about the disease that is no different than when you stage by MRI is that, you know, neither test is good for microinvasive disease. It's hard, uh, you know, you can overcall things when there's peritumal infl inflammation. Um, and then if you have a post polypectomy inflammation or biopsy artifact that can affect both kinds of stages. This is a patient of mine um, who had a actually a squamous cell uh, of the anal canal that was in, involving the upper rectum. You can see part of the puborectalis muscle here. This is the tumor right here. There's a question on the MRI whether it was invading the vagina. This is a sagittal view where you can actually measure how the length is. And then this is the patient, I actually put the probe in the vagina first and you can actually see a very clear border between the vaginal wall and um, the tumor in the rectum. So this was a T3 lesion, uh, not invading the vagina. Uh, this is a patient who was sent for TEM. Uh, it was thought to be an early lesion. You can measure uh, the angle of what your resection will look like. Um, you can see that there's that uh, break of the submucosa indicating a T1 lesion, but in an intact 
muscularis propria. You can see nice intact muscularis propria on this sagittal view, but this patient had a few lymph nodes. Um, so this was actually T1 and 1 disease. So uh, this is just what, um, uh, what you would get if you're interested in staging. Um, this is probably not the best reimbursement because these rectal cancers do take some time. So you really just wanna be able to do this for a selected few patients that you're trying to work out for TAMIS or TEM um, for the most part and for those rare patients that uh, have clips or can't get MRIs. Um, but th this is, these are the same billing codes that are used for um, for anal imaging as well. And there may be a better yield in terms of someone who's in private practice and trying to get up their bill, billing and RVUs based on that. It's important to know that what you can do these 3D rendering uh, um, and you do can bill a little bit more um, uh, by using those codes. So going on to endoanal ultrasounds, um, we can use ultrasound to look at the anal canal in terms of uh, assessing our patients with fecal incontinence um, in terms of uh, imaging patients that have um, an abscess or fistula, and then occasionally you can do it for patients with anal pain. Um, it's usually, it's the same probe, but you don't use that balloon. Um, you just put the condom over it because the anus obviously closes around um, that probe, and so you get the contact without a lot of air. Uh, typically, I teach people how to read ultrasound, again, looking at the proximal, mid, and distal anal canal, and I'll show you some representations of what that looks like. And the puborectalis looks like a U-shaped um, uh, structure. The internal anal sphincter is hypoechoic, uh, and then the external anal sphincter has a mixed echogenicity, but is more hyperechoic. So this is just a representation of the mid-anal canal. The, the hemorrhoidal tissues and subepithelial tissues will look this sort of gray. This black is the hypoechoic internal anal sphincter. And then outside um, uh, right here, this is mixed echogenicity. This is um, the external sphincter. Sometimes you can see a nice bright white line right outside the internal sphincter. That's the longitudinal muscle coalescing. These are representations of the upper anal canal in a, a woman versus a male. You can see sort of the wider shape of the puborectalis sling here. This is a more narrower pelvis uh, and a more acute view. Mid-anal canal of a female um, versus a male, um, just more elliptical in terms of its structure for the male patient. These are some, uh, some pathology of mid anal canal. This is a patient that's had um, a distal, like a, a patient had a fissure and someone actually did a dilatation. Uh, so you can see a fractured uh, internal anal sphincter. It's not continuous. And then what you will see sometimes is that if you're imaging somebody for um, incontinence and you see a um, sphincter that looks quite wide and quite um, hypertrophied like this, you, you may want to search further to see if they're prolapsing because this can occur with the, the trauma of prolapse. Uh, in the mid anal canal, you can, um, uh, you can try to see um, and accentuate whether uh, there's a sphincter defect by putting a finger in the vagina of a female patient. So this is the fingertip in the vagina here, and you can actually measure the perineal body measurement. You can measure the size of a sphincter defect. Uh, this is an image of the transverse perineal uh, muscles uh, that are coming in that you can actually see in a patient. And then the distal anal canal is where you're distal to the inner sphincteric groove, so you have loss of the internal sphincter and you just have external sphincter muscle. So um, in terms of looking at fistulas disease, there it's not recommended in our practice parameters to do routine imaging. And I would say that um, I don't routinely image all patients um, uh, that have anal fistulas. I think, you know, you can obviously see a lot of these patients, you can examine them and tell if they have an inner sphincteric fistula. But I do use it fairly liberally because I do think it helps in counseling a patient. I mean, I think you can just take a patient to the OR and do an exam under anesthesia, and then they can come out with a CTON or they can come out with a fistulotomy. But I do think that as a patient, I would like to know what operation I'm going to have and what my recovery is gonna look like. And so I do think that the imaging can be quite helpful for counseling a patient. And then I do think that, uh, especially in uh, women who've had vaginal deliveries, it, it can help to have a baseline understanding of what their sphincter looks like. 
So this is a patient of mine uh, who had a complex fistula. So we inject hydrogen peroxide into the external opening of the fistula and the hydrogen peroxide, the bubbles, will, make, uh, will show up bright white on an ultrasound. So what you can see on this is that this patient has an internal horseshoe um, in the inner sphincteric groove here on the left side. And then outside the sphincter complex, the patient has uh, a horseshoe um, as well. And then if you go over here and you're looking in the sagittal view, you can see where this is coming in uh, through. So this is a, post a, post mid a posterior midline fistula coming through and you can actually measure how high this is above the inner sphincter groove um, and how high it is from the anal verge. So it gives you some uh, planning and counseling uh, mechanisms by looking at that. This is another patient of mine uh, who had had a previous vaginal delivery. Uh, she um, had what appeared to probably be a trans fistula. You can see that on this image over here. Um, you can see right here that this fistula is actually coming in above where either her sphincter closes or she has a full sphincter injury. When you get down to the non-opacified views, the views I did before injecting the peroxide, what you can see is, is that she actually has an internal sphincter defect. And then she, when you come down a little bit below this, you can see her external sphincter muscle is actually intact. So this is a patient that we put a CTOT in and because she had this internal sphincter defect, she's not a candidate for a lift. So she underwent an endorectal advancement flap a couple of weeks ago. So this is um, uh, an example of rendering and sort of what our 3D um, views can look like. This is a patient I just saw um, who has fecal incontinence after having a vaginal delivery. So here you can see me scrolling up from the outside toward the inside. So here I'm getting toward the level of the puberectalis right there. I'm gonna scroll back down and we're not quite seeing those nice two circles that we would like to see. So here, that's where I'm measuring the patient's external sphincter defect. And so this patient actually has a combined internal and external sphincter defect. So I can come in from the side, I can rotate the image. I can measure if the patient did have a little bit of a sphincter anteriorly, like what the, the, the length of that is. But really, she doesn't really, she has just a tiny bit of scar distally, but doesn't really, there's a big black nothingness in this front area right here. You, the machine will also um, uh, take computer averaging and, and, and give a rendered image. So this is more of a rendered image. So you can see like the break of the muscle right here. And that here there's nothing, uh, no muscle, uh, no internal sphincter, no external sphincter muscle. So this is a patient that's being um, considered for sphincteroplasty uh, given her symptoms. So I'd like to move on to interactive physiology testing. And we will talk a little bit about um, manometry. We'll very briefly touch on neurophysiology. Um, I think we use that less and less um, in our practice, although um, some of the big GI um, labs will, will still use that. And then we'll talk a little bit about dynamic imaging. Um, the conditions that we're going to talk about mainly are obstructive defecation and fecal incontinence. And then um, I use it also for patients who have rectal prolapse and uh, uh, rectocele. So the balloon expulsion test is really just a screening test for patients with obstructive defecation. Um, this can be done in your office uh, if you're referring people on um, or you suspect that they have obstructive defecation. What you're really doing is you're putting a well-lubricated balloon, uh, having the patient put it in, in privacy in the bathroom, and then it gets filled typically to 50 cc's. The patient will sit on the toilet, and then the patient tries to expel the balloon. Uh, typically, it's thought that you need to be a normal uh, test um, or a negative test that you have to pass the balloon within 60 seconds. So um, it's a decent screening test for obstructive defecation, but definitely there are patients who do have ODS that can pass the balloon. And there are definitely patients um, that don't have ODS that can't, that can't pass the balloon. So again, it's sensitivity and specificity, and specificity are, are not the highest, um, but it's a simple, easy test that can be done in the office. So what we're really here to discuss is anal manometry. And these are the different, um, um, uh, things that we're looking for. 
So the resting anal pressure is really a reflection of mainly internal anal, anal, anal sphincter function. So um, about 30% of the resting pressure can come from the external sphincter and up to 15% can come from the anal cushions. But typically we think of resting uh, pressure as internal anal sphincter uh, function. On the other hand, squeeze pressure um, is where it's reflective of the external anal sphincter, that striated muscle that we have voluntary control over. And really what you're looking at is the squeeze increment, which is where you subtract the resting pressure from that. So you wanna see how much additional force that you can get from voluntary external anal uh, sphincter contraction and puborectalis uh, uh, function. And then you can uh, look at the duration um, of the squeeze because some people can get a high squeeze, but it doesn't last very long and it shows fatigue. You can measure the anal sphincter length by manometry or a high pressure zone. Rectal sensation is one of the important uh, components of manometry. Uh, you can look at capacity and compliance. Uh, the anal um, sphincter uh, reflexes, which is the rare, the rectal anal inhibitor reflex is a screening test for Hirschsprung's disease. And then in terms of dynamic maneuvers, we don't usually use cough very often, but Valsalva is very important because what we want to do is we want to see what the sphincter is doing during this Valsalva maneuver to look for obstructed defecation. So um, there are a lot of different systems you can use, um, and I wanted to just show you two different examples. So on the left here, this is a 2D disposable uh, probe. So this is what we use in our office. Um, so there's a balloon, the, there's four sensors for four quadrants right here, uh, and then you can see these numbers. And so um, when we um, do the manometry, it's a stationary pull through technique. And the technician who does the exam is moving this and getting, getting data at different stations, typically six stations. We're measuring usually over six centimeters of the anus of the rectum. Uh, on the, these probes right here, these are disposable. They're very easy to set up. They have high reproducibility and, um, and can generate fairly accurate data. On the other hand, this is um, a 3D high definition anal manometry probe. Um, this is what's used in most academic centers. And when these are reusable, they're very expensive. If they break, um, they're uh, hard to process. Um, they um, probably are used um, at, at lower volumes um, uh, because of this. And, um, but they generate uh, these quite elaborate pictures and you'll see some um, uh, in the upcoming uh, slides. And there's a lot of uh, impressive formatting of the data. And really you can get, there's almost like a 256 different um, data points that are melded into a more continuous uh, computer generated uh, image uh, to look at. So one of the things we mentioned is on the manometry, uh, we want to look at the Valsalva uh, maneuver. And what should happen then is that your external anal sphincter should relax during Valsalva because that's what's going to let stool out during defecation. So lack of relaxation or the opposite contraction, that's going to show, that's going to cause obstructed defecation. So contraction is paradoxic contraction or a lack of relaxation we refer to as non-relaxation. So Satish Rao um, has described four different patterns of dysenergic defecation that can be obtained or measured on anal manometry. So type one is where the intrarectal pressure rises and that's what we want it to do, but the intraanal pressure increases, which is what we don't want it to do. Type two is when there's no increase in pressure, it really just stays the same. And there's also an increase in intraanal pressure, two things we don't want. Type three is when the intrarectal pressure correctly rises, but there's no change in the anal pressure. And type four is when there is no increase in rectal pressure, but there's also no change in the anal pressure. Really, there's just no movement whatsoever. So this is um, an example of a patient that has paradoxic contraction on the right. Uh, here on the left on 3D manometry, there's normal relaxation when the patient's asked to Valsalva. Um, here you can see the elevation and you can see um, how the computer formats um, the image of con paradoxic contraction. And this is what the 2D images would look like where you just see the elevation of the pressures um, uh, during uh, uh, paradoxic contraction. 
So the recto anal inhibitory reflex, I think it's important to understand like what it represents and why we're looking for it. So it's elicited by filling a balloon within the rectum. Typically it's 30 to 50 cc's of uh, saline that you're putting in the balloon, but you do have to recognize that there are patients, if they have a really chronic obstructed defecation, their rectum is gonna be a bit chronically distended. Um, uh, or if they have really blunted rectal sensation, uh, you might get a false um, uh, negative or false positive test. So it's important to, to keep trying to elevate your balloon volume uh, to see if you can get the reflex. So the distension of the rectal wall, what it typically will do is cause first a contraction of the external sphincter muscle. So you'll see a blip increase in pressure and then a quick uh, relaxation of the internal anal sphincter muscle. So you can see a decrease. So you can also not can see a rare in patients who have super, super low resting pressures because it might be hard to measure that difference. So that's one other thing to, to be aware of. So the rare reflex is thought to be um, uh, created to help with the sampling mechanisms of the anus. So what it is is that if the rectum gets distended, um, the sphincter relaxes a little bit just so it can al allow uh, the person to note, is this gas? Is this more than gas? Um, so the, the whole idea of the rare ref reflex is thought to allow for um, uh, sampling and discrimination. So here we have, um, uh, you, can, you can't really see the external sphincter uh, 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 uptake on this one, but uh, the balloon's inflated, you get a quick uh, external sphincter muscle contraction, and here you can see the decrease in pressure related uh, to the inter, um, internal anal sphincter relaxation, and you can see this in the 2D um, uh, measurements right here. So uh, there are four different um, uh, measurements, or three different measurements we do uh, for rectal sensation. You can use um, uh, the, the others to, uh, to measure rectal compliance. And mainly these volumes are looking to see um, uh, whether the patient feels distension appropriately, do they get more pain uh, and more discomfort at a lower volume than average. We see that a lot in our fecal incontinence patients. You know, for patients who have very blunted rectal sensation that it takes a huge volume before they feel it, those are patients that um, I'm always a little bit more nervous and more wary about operative intervention of other findings, uh, just because the blunted rectal sensation does seem to be a, a thing that's a bit more difficult to um, overcome. Um, blunted rectal sensation may also be another target for biofeedback therapy. There are some therapists that will do uh, balloon volume sensory training uh, to help uh, treat patients. So another thing that's important to know is that um, between 2014 and 2017, uh, there was an international um, group of both gastroenterologists, uh, gastro uh, neurophysiologists, and colorectal surgeons that got together that made a consensus about, you know, how should manometry be performed, how should it be read, and how should it be reported, and. Really, they were trying to do something that was very um, similar to the Chicago criteria for esophageal manometry. And so that's what the London protocol is. And so what they do is they st state that in reporting um, the data, really what you're looking at is uh, these four categories. You're looking at disorders of the recto anal inhibitory reflex, the rare. You're looking at disorders of anal tone and contractility, so uh, internal sphincter dysfunction and external sphincter dysfunction, disorders of, of sensation, and then disorders of uh, coordination, uh, which is really what we're mainly looking at a lot of the time, except for um, the weakness um, issues. So major findings include absence of the rare, anal hypotension or hypocontractility, meaning anal um, internal sphincter dysfunction or hypocontractility of the external sphincter muscle, and then both rectal hyposensitivity and rectal hypersensitivity. Minor findings uh, will be patients that have hypertension, anal hypertension. You'll see these patients that have really tight internal anal sphincters, like patients that have uh, dyssynergic defecation and also who have anal fissures, and then uh, dyssynergy, which we talked about the four different types uh, that Satish Rao described. Uh, so I do wanted to give you just a little bit of a hint for people who are thinking about doing manometry in their clinic or bringing it to their practice. 
Uh, it's important to know that there are, are two different codes to bill. Uh, we always think of manometry um, as um, uh, the 91122 code and measuring uh, the strength, but it's also important that the sensation codes uh, are actually uh, completely different and actually uh, tend to generate more in billing um, uh, for the procedure. Uh, one of the neurophysiology tests that we tend to use still, mainly because it's such a good thing for biofeedback therapy is surface EMG. Uh, what we are trying to do is get a global sense of what the sphincter is doing. Uh, you can use an external um, anal monitor, which is what we use right now. There's also an anal plug, which is often used for biofeedback therapy. And what it does is it just shows a very global sense of what the sphincter complex is doing uh, during the squeeze, rest, and push maneuvers. Um, again, we like it because it's often what uh, people will use uh, for biofeedback therapy um, for both fecal incontinence and obstructive defecation. So this is an example of two patients. This yellow is the rest. There's an orange bar that's the squeeze. The greens are the push. So what we want to see is when the patient squeezes, you want to see a high uptake in activity. When the patient pushes, you want to see it lower than at rest. And so this is normal. Whereas on this patient, it goes up, but maybe not as much as in the squeeze because there's probably some fatigue here. Excuse me. And then when these patients push, there's a high range of activity um, showing paradoxic contraction right there. Pudental uh, nerve terminal motor latency. Um, uh, we have gotten away from doing because there's so much variability in the results and we don't really use this in the past. In the very distant past, there were some centers that felt that if you had bilateral pudental neuropathy, that you weren't a good candidate for a um, sphincteroplasty. Other centers didn't believe that data. Um, what you're really doing is you're stimulating the pudental nerve interrectally with the fingertip, and then you're measuring uh, the muscular contraction of the external sphincter muscle based uh, at the lower level here. A normal latency was 2.0 plus or minus 0.2 milliseconds. Um, it's really very operator dependent uh, and again, not super useful. Um, but it, what it's important to know is, is that there are um, uh, labs, GI labs that are looking at um, other uh, nerve motor latencies done either from uh, the lumbar or the sacral uh, nerve levels. Um, similarly, trying to look at uh, nerve conduct, um, nerve conduction, and um, but there's not really, it doesn't really change what we're doing uh, in terms of, of therapies as of yet. So dynamic imaging, um, I wanted to go over this a bit. This is uh, looking for both patients with obstructed defecation, really trying to see, is this a functional problem? Is this a, an anatomic problem? Is it both? Um, for prolapse, you can identify multi-compartment disease. Um, I think it helps me prevent recurrences by looking at the anatomy of the prolapse. And then I also want to make a, um, a recommendation that I do think it can be helpful for imaging our patients and with fecal incontinence. What we're looking for is both structural um, abnormalities, pelvic floor descent, intussusception, prolapse, rectus seals, seal, as well as the functional um, abnormalities. So um, this is a really old study, but I still think it's important that, um, you know, you can miss a lot on a physical examination. Um, so I do think that imaging can be important to get a whole picture of what's going on in the pelvic floor. Um, we're gonna really mainly stick with defecography and dynamic MRI. Pelvic floor ultrasound is pretty interesting and pretty neat, um, but very technically demanding and not really well reimbursed to my understanding in the United States. And I've dabbled in it a little bit, but I haven't really stuck with it. So we do a lot of cine defecography at our center uh, because it's easy to perform. Um, and uh, it's uh, done in the upright position. And we really feel that uh, having patients pass contrast sitting up is much easier and much more natural, although still bizarre for them, um, than lying on their side and trying to pass contrast. Uh, you can get all the compartments, uh, but you are giving the patients ionizing radiation. You know, you can't beat some of the superior soft tissue um, images that you see on MR defecography. It really is better at looking at all the compartments uh, and there's no radiation. But again, um, what we struggle with is trying to find a dedicated person uh, to read the images and to really look at what we're looking at. 
So I wanted to go through a few normal parameters. Um, so what you hear um, about the anorectal angle, what that really is, it's the line of the posterior border of the rectum um, to the central axis of the anal canal. So that's this line to this line. Uh, this green box is the anorectal junction, which is where uh, the rectum tapers off um, to the anal canal. And at rest, this is normally 90 degrees. And what it does is it straightens, it becomes more oblique with defecation. That's what it normally does. The other uh, reference you'll hear is the pubic coccygeal line. It's between the inferior border of the pubic ramus and the last coccygeal joint. Um, it's really the line that defines prolapse. Um, so it too, it's normal for things to move two centimeters below that not line during defecation. Anything more is considered a prolapse of the organ. So again, during normal defecation, this is the start with um, evacuation, you get straightening uh, or more obliqueness of the anal rectal angle, the anal canal shortens, the pelvic floor distends, you get good opening of the anus. Uh, it's important to know that not everything is pathologic. You'll get these MR defecography reports and it sounds like there's a million seals that you'll see there. Um, rectus seals can be really common and in some studies up to 93% of women, regardless of parity, will have a rectus seal. And a susception can also be um, uh, common up to 20% of patients who are, or people who are imaged that don't have any symptoms. Uh, I, evacuation is not always in one fail swoop. Uh, it can take on average two attempts to evacuate and it's normal not to evacuate all the contrast. It's thought that most people will evacuate 68 to 82% um, in normal uh, without symptoms. So this is, these are MRIs looking at paradoxic puberectalis syndrome. At rest, you see the baseline image. When you squeeze, your anorectal angle should be more acute or 90 degrees, so that's correct. And this looks very similar to our first, so this is a component of non-relaxation. This one is even more dramatic. This is uh, at rest, anorectal angle about 90 degrees. With squeeze, it becomes a little bit more acute. With Valsalva, it becomes even more acute. So you can see this functional narrowing. And you can see almost like there's this little bit of a rectocele, this outpouching here. You can see how really this puberectalis is driving this pathology by doing the opposite. So the rectocele is an innocent bystander in this situation. So here is a patient uh, who has a rectal intussusception. This is a defecography. So what we can see on this patient with obstructed defecation, the rectum pushes forward. Uh, you can see that this anorectal angle is a little bit um, a component of non-relaxation. This intussusception is probably what I would call a grade two or grade three. And this is probably a patient. I would start off with biofeedback therapy um, first before any operative attempt. Um, and then on the other hand, there's this patient uh, who basically the anus opened up pretty well. You get this widening of the rectovaginal septum. I'm gonna play it again so you can see. You get the sense that there's this bowel coming in between the two. And you can really see that the pathology here is what's preventing this contrast from coming out. There's a grade four rectal intussusception and a large intracele that's preventing this patient from getting all the contrast out. So that might be somebody who a ventral rectopexy could be helpful for. So, I do want to make an argument about how high grade intussusception should be thought about in our patients with fecal incontinence. Um, there are some studies that suggest that um, patients that have um, high grade rectal intussusception uh, and fecal incontinence, some of them will present with only FI, some of them will have only obstructive defecation. But really, a lot of patients with high-grade intussusception will have a mixture of um, fecal incontinence and obstructive defecation. So in your fecal incontinence patients, it's really important to, to, to tease out the obstructive defecation symptoms as well. And the mechanism of fecal incontinence in these patients is thought to be related um, to the intussusception based on the fact that we know that with deeper inter, um, intussusceptions, so intra-anal uh, uh, intussusceptions, you get weakness of this internal sphincter from this dipping down and stretching this out. So um, maybe not as much in the grade ones or two um, prolapses that are intrarectal, but if you get a grade three, which is the upper anal canal or a grade four, which is 
halfway into the anal canal or lower, um, you can see that there's damage that can be created there by that internal prolapse. It's also thought, we talked about the rare and how, you know, inflation of the rectum leads to relaxation of the internal anal sphincter muscle. And so the question is, is does this in a susception cause that rare reflex and cause anal hypotonia that causes um, uh, incontinence? And then the more easier one to understand, and what I think we see the most is that, you know, often patients will have incomplete evacuation, obstructive defecation symptoms, and then they walk around and then they leak out little pellets. And it's because they can't empty related to this. Um, and they have anal hypotonia related to this um, that causes their fecal incontinence. So on uh, this, here's another patient uh, who um, uh, had fecal incontinence. She also had some obstructive defecation symptoms. Uh, so she's here getting her internal prolapse right here. And then what this will often look like on the manometry is, is that they'll have these very short sphincter lengths. So you only see a high pressure zone of 40 in the distal one centimeter, but then they'll have preserved squeeze increments. So their external sphincter muscle is good, but they have weaker internal anal sphincter muscles. When I see manometry that looks like that, I'm expecting to possibly see something on the defecography. All right. So um, this paper came from the Oxford Clinic um, in 2015. And this was looking at uh, the success of SNS in patients um, who had high grade internal rectal prolapse, so intraanal prolapse versus patients who did not. And you can see that when they did the, the test phase, you know, the, there was more success in the non um, herp patients, but there was a fairly good success initially in that short time frame where they were testing the patients. But when you looked after the patients were implanted, and if you had a fairly high criteria of decreasing the fizzy, which is a continence score by greater than 50%, it was much better in patients who did not have herp, and it was very low in patients who have high grade in a susception. Uh, interestingly, they found that the GI quality of life only improved uh, in the patients that didn't have herp. And, I, and this is probably because these patients that do have herp probably also have obstructive defecation, which would affect their GI quality of life score. And so the conclusion was, is that a high grade of susception, uh, they can have a detrimental effect on the success of neuromodulation treatment for FI. So we looked at our patients um, uh, similarly uh, with this. And, and I have to say that I've sort of drank the Kool-Aid from the Oxford group and I feel like I saw this. Um, we had a smaller percentage of our patients that had uh, rectal anal and susception. And we actually found that um, our patients uh, that had an in, susception versus not were pretty similar with, with their results of neuromodulation therapy. So we could not prove um, the Oxford Clinic's point on this, but I do think that there's something there. Um, I do think that in our uh, paper, we probably had less patients that had the grade four rectal intussusceptions. So I think um, it's just something to be aware of that um, if your patient has obstructive defecation, in addition to their fecal incontinence, you may want to consider dynamic imaging. If you have a patient that didn't improve after neuromodulation therapy um, for fecal incontinence, maybe you should get dynamic imaging. It's just one of those things um, to think about whether that's contributing to their symptoms. So um, this is how we developed our accidental bowel leakage uh, protocol. Um, patients who have rare symptoms or are not surgical candidates will go into the biofeedback arm. We don't do a lot of injectables anymore, but those would be patients that we would consider. Patients that um, are candidates for sphincter repairs are patients, um, to me, that develop symptoms of fecal incontinence right after the trauma of uh, the delivery. So those are the patients that I'll do the ultrasound on and usually also some anorectal physiology to see does the muscle contract as well as having a defect? And those are patients that I look at for overlapping sphincterplasty. For patients who um, had their symptoms much later in life of incontinence after tra traumatic delivery or have no relationship to the delivery, those are, in, in, if they're good in good condition, those patients who I will um, you know, do a defecography as part of my whole testing and consider for ventral rectopexy. For patients who have mainly urge incontinence, um, uh, 
or if, if a patient has had like previous radiation and there's no way I'm ever going to go into their abdomen to do a, or put mesh in their abdomen, those are patients that, you know, if they have significant enough incontinence, maybe they can go right to the peripheral nerve evaluation. Maybe they, they don't benefit as much for um, interactive physiology testing. Those are patients on the SNS pathway in my eyes. On the other hand, how to put this together for your constipation patients. So um, this algorithm is really for patients who have failed over-the-counter medications for constipation. So the next step based on mo most of the GI societies is then to do anorectal physiology testing. And the reason behind that is, is because um, prescription um, constipation medications are quite expensive. They don't work as well for patients who have obstructive defecation. So you want to weed those patients out before putting them on the Linzess and Amatiza and all of that. So patients who have normal manometry and balloon expulsion tests, they go on to do the transit study and they get all the medications. The patients who have abnormal tests based on the GI algorithms, those are going on to the defecation disorder pathway. If there's anything inconclusive, those are the people who they recommend imaging. So in that same uh, AGA pathway, a lot of those patients who are decided to have a defecation disorder, they go through biofeedback therapy, they see a dietitian, you can repeat the balloon expulsion. And if it's normal, then they move on to the transit pathway. But it, then if it's abnormal, you go on to your abnormal, you, your dynamic imaging. So on the other hand, a colorectal practice, this is really how we do it. We do the manometry, EMG, and dynamic imaging, and then we really figure out what's going on all at once. So if they have pure anismus, they go into the biofeedback pathway. Patients who fail this may go on to Botox injection later on. If they have anismus but have a full thickness rectal prolapse, we'll fix the rectal prolapse first, but sign them up for the biofeedback therapy after. It's really hard to do biofeedback therapy when you have a full thickness rectal prolapse. So I really don't make my patients do that. If you have anismus, uh, but have non obstruct, uh, but then you have like a non full thickness rectal prolapse, you go to the biofeedback therapy first. And you can make it to the surgical correction arm if you pass your biofeedback therapy or if you're counseled extensively. And this is the only thing we can think of to make you better. And then if you have normal relaxation, so you're not, your, your coordination is good, but you have rectocele, rectal nociception, rectal prolapse, those are the people will take on to surgical repair um, without doing biofeedback therapy or anything else first. So that's my quick and dirty algorithm uh, for interactive physiology testing. That's some hints on ultrasounds. Um, I hope this is helpful for when you guys are taking your boards and I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Thorson, um, for that crash course in indirect ultrasound and uh, physiology testing. Um, that was very informative for myself and I'm sure for lots of the other fellows out there. Um, one question um, that we had uh, was for boards exam purposes in particular, when would you, um, you know, you cited the example of patient with clips in place that need to fall out before an MRI can safely be performed, when would you recommend or, or cite an endorectal ultrasound as your um, first line versus MRI for uh, rectal cancer staging uh, in a board setting? Yeah, so I think um, there's not really, I think the biggest issue um, uh, for the actual staging in these post polypectomy patients is you know how long do you have inflammation related to the polypectomy uh, before um, you do that? And I don't think there's any data out there. Um, uh, so what I would say in the board setting would be is that you would consider doing the ultrasound one to two uh, weeks after, or you know, or your staging MRI if you're going to do that instead. And you just justify that saying you just don't want any peri procedural inflammation to show a false positive on your staging. Awesome. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Thorson. Um, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with us tonight. And thanks to all the viewers out there for uh, tuning in. If you missed part of the lecture or want to recap it, um, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Um, so thanks, everybody.